Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode. Um, in this one I was going to show you this camera and have a walk through with it. This is the Canon EOS 1N. Um, this is the top of the range flagship model, the EOS 1 in the film range. Obviously the 1D is the digital camera. But luckily, or not so luckily, last week I managed to pick up this uh, little outfit. This is the original EOS 1. Uh, dating back to the late 1980s, I think it was about 88, 89 time this came out and this ran through until 94 when it was replaced with the 1N, a slightly updated version. Just move that one out of the way. So yeah, I managed to pick this one up on, um, on eBay and the reason I was interested in it was basically because of this grip. Um, there's like three options with these cameras. There's a very small grip that just fits here and that uses the 2CR5 battery and you don't need all this bolt on bottom bit, this extra bit that goes on the bottom down here. Um, on the other camera, on the one end, that came with a smaller grip which takes uh, four AA batteries and this is the, um, the power booster one, this is the one that takes eight batteries. I do believe I do have batteries in it, so yeah this takes eight batteries. 8 AA batteries commonly available. Obviously it adds to the weight of the camera, but the camera's pretty heavy to start with. So, And the other advantage of this grip is it has the vertical shutter release. Um, there's a lock button here that, that means that you can then use it in the portrait mode and you can use that shutter button. The other grip doesn't have that. So it was a grip I was really interested in because these grips on the dreaded eBay Everyone's asking quite a lot of money for them, sort of £100, £150 for the, just for the grip. That's without the camera. And um, that's quite a ridiculous amount of money. The camera and the grip, not the lens, I had, this is my own lens, um, cost me £47. So that's the reason that I bought it. It arrived last week, late last week. So I put on here the original lens that would have come with it. It's always a good idea to keep a lens cap on the lens. This one's also got a filter on it as well. So you just want to make sure your filter's clean and everything. That protects the uh, the front element of the lens. And this is the original to release the lens. You just push it on the side and just turn it, the red dot at the top, and then the lens comes off. This is the original metal mount, 50mm 1.8. So this is the, the right lens for the era, I say 1988-89. And this was the first professional camera in the new EOS range with the EF mount. Um, it was launched um, or announced and launched a couple of years earlier but this was the, the, the first professional in the EOS range electro optical system. This was the one that was designed for pros. It has a magnesium shell polycarbonate body Unlike the uh, the comp competition, which would have been the Nikon F4 at the time, it doesn't have a removable prism. Canon did away with all this removable prism stuff. Very much based on the design of the T90, the Kalani design cameras. And uh, yeah, it's done away with all the dials and everything on the top. It's kind of a camera reimagined. It's quite heavy. Uh, I can find what I've done with the scales. Let's shove her on the scales. This is with batteries in it, so it is quite a heavy camera. She is weighing at 14, 18 kilogram, uh, 14, 18 kilograms, 14, 18 grams. So about one and a half kilos without any lens is attached. And the lens, out of interest, doesn't weigh very much, I wouldn't have thought. It's another, say, 200 on top of that. So yeah, it's quite a, it's quite a heavy thing. If you're a PAP, you probably carry two of these, one with a wide angle lens, like a 16 to 35 28, and the other one would have a 80 to 200 or a 70 to 200 zoom on it, and you can probably carry one of these 50 mils in your pocket just in case you needed it, because it's a fast aperture, it's 1.8. So, there, that's a brief history of the camera. It was uh, the three iterations of the EOS 1. There's the EOS 1N, and then the last one was the EOS 1V, and that was available up until well, quite recently, actually. They still had stocks of new ones. You can see the mirror's a bit dirty in this one. But then what do you expect for under £50? So, looking at it overall, it looks in fairly good condition. I haven't put a film or anything through it yet. There's no strap or anything with it, so... Yeah, it looks in fairly reasonable condition. 
Look at the back, this will be familiar to anybody who shoots Canon DSLRs. And of course the big advantage of this is that you can use the same lenses on Canon Digital as you can on Canon Film cameras. So all of my lovely L glass will, will work fine with this, no issues. I've even got a new one of the newer lenses. This lens was never around when this camera was available. This is the 40mm 2.8 EF lens. This one's wearing a lens hood. That's what passes for a lens hood nowadays. This little plastic thing here. That's technology for you. But yeah, this is a little 40mm 2.8 lens. Quite nice. But even that will work with this with no issue. Any EF lens, any EF body, film or digital, it will work fine. There's absolutely no issues with it. So, let's have a quick run through the features, and this thing is feature packed. So let's come down and have a look. Let's move you down a bit closer. Sort out the focus, and then we can start to see what's going on. So this is the top of the camera. So you've got a shutter release over here. And you've got what they call, I think, a command dial over this side that you can make adjustments on. And you've got a little button here that you can push and it will illuminate the LCD when you're working at night. Like I say, fixed pentaprism, so no interchangeable finders. Uh, it does have dioptic correction on it and I think it does have a blind as well, so you can close this if you don't want to have your eye right behind the viewfinder. And then over here we have the the buttons. It's designed really that it's, it's going to make it very difficult to accidentally make changes, that's the idea behind it. So we'll start first off with this, it's a mode button, so this will give you the modes for the camera. Good idea if you turn it on first. So on the back here, sort that down, you see it's in the L position which is locked, you've got the A position which is on, activated I suppose, and then you've also got a, a beep as well. You can turn the beep off just by putting it back into the A mode. You also here have a partial rewind button because this camera rewinds the film automatically. So if you don't want to shoot the whole film, you want to rewind it early, you can push that in and it will rewind the film before you finish shooting on it. So don't push it accidentally. So on the top you can see in this display, it's saying that we're in, um, get the focus a bit sharper, we're in uh, AV mode, which is aperture priority. So I would be selecting the aperture and the camera will be setting the shutter speed. Shutter speed range is anything from 30 seconds to a whopping one eight thousandth of a second. So you can use fast lenses on um, bright days, pretty much wide open, which is perfect with a, say, a 35 one four. This window over here shows you the focusing mode because there's no lens attached. It's saying manual focus down here. This next window down is showing you the drive. It's on S, which is for single drive. So it will only take one, one, one frame at a time. Over here we have a little thing that shows us the metering mode. I can never remember these. It's got spot, centre weighted average and something else. It doesn't have matrix metering like the Canada, like the Nikons do. Um, but yeah, I think there's three metering modes. And then you have a frame counter and underneath you've got exposure compensation. So you've got overexposure or underexposure. Exposure compensation applies to when you're in an auto mode. So if I push the mode button again, turn the command dial, this is the depth of field um, function. Um, you can click the, uh, the shutter depth button down halfway to do an exposure at a certain distance and then a, a further away distance and it will work out the aperture to give you the depth of field for what you've just asked it to work out. Interesting feature, not really played around with that very much. M is for manual, so you have to set both the shutter speed, which again is adjusted with this dial. And you'll see it has, it's not the full stops, it has all of the different stops. So 8,000th of a second, which is super quick really, all the way down to 30 seconds, I do believe. Just keep going, a long way to go. Yep, 30 seconds. So that's manual mode, that's how you would set the uh, the shutter speed and the aperture would be set by this one back here. Again, so you can't make mistakes, this one has an on off switch as well. So when it's in the on position, this would adjust your aperture if you had a lens fitted. So let me pop this lens on and I'll show you. So I turn it off. 
take this little tiny EF lens to mount a lens, red dot to red dot. Turn it, and like Nikon, you select autofocus on the lens. So you see all of the EF lenses have this little button, autofocus or manual focus. Whereas on the Nikons, it's actually on the body that you decide whether you're going to do this. This was the big difference, really. Nikon kind of got their autofocus idea and mythology a little bit mixed up. They had this idea of putting the focus motor in the body, not in the lens. And uh, Canon, with the EOS system, decided that every lens is going to have a motor in it. We're not going to have motors in the body. And I think it made it faster. I think a lot of pros switched from Nikon to Canon when these cameras came out because the autofocus was a lot better. Although this only has one autofocus point right in the centre. But yeah, the autofocus on Canons has always been, um, at the time, was, was a lot quicker than the Nikons apparently. I don't have a, a Nikon 4 a F4, so I can't really tell you about that one. But yeah, no aperture ring. There is a focus ring, but it's, I don't know, a bit Mickey Mouse to me. It's not like a proper focus ring ring. So if I turn this back on, we're back in manual mode, put the focus out. So as I turn this one, you can see that the aperture changes, so it knows that the lenses are 2.8, and you can select the aperture there. In the viewfinder, there's obviously a bar that tells you when you've got the correct exposure, over and under, etc. Press the mode button, hold it down again, change it. Then we get the TV, and that's going to be shutter priority. So it displays the shutter speed, and then when you half press the shutter, it will display the aperture and 2.8. It's, uh, it's too dark for that. So I want to come down to something a bit more reasonable. No. ISO is it set to? It doesn't seem to like that. The camera is DX coded, so when you open the back, you will notice that it's got the DX coding, so it takes the speed from the film cassette. Uh, quite a useful feature. You can override it, there is a, 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 a you can change the ISO. It's got the quick load system on it as well. I'm going to put film in this because I need to test this camera out. I've not tried it. It sounds okay, it looks okay in the back, it looks quite clean. Um, yeah, it doesn't look too bad at all. Um, right, ISO, you'll see there two buttons. So if I push that one and that one, that will set the ISO, that's saying 400. And you just move the command dial to change your ISO, so that would be ISO 800. So if I take that off and uh, try again, hopefully it will show me an aperture, but it keeps showing me 2.8 because I've got the lens cap on. What an idiot. So now it's saying 5.6. So if you change the shutter speed again, increase it to say a 30th. It comes up to 3.2, so it shows you the aperture. And again, with apertures, it's not just full stops, I think it's third stops or half stops that you can have there. And then again, you can press mode and it just cycles through the modes. Bulb is your B setting, shutter stays open as long as you keep the shutter release depressed. Um, P is the program mode so it selects both. Quite a useful mode especially if you're just starting out in photography. You say in there 25th at 2.8 that's what the camera thinks is, is good. So, program mode is quite useful for starting out. I press it again and it just cycles through so it just goes around in a circle depending on what mode you want. So that's the function of the mode button. This one here is autofocus, so we've got one shot, so it will focus once and then it will sort of stop. And then we have AI Servo, which is for continuous focusing for sports action, wildlife, etc. So there's only the two modes on there. Normally leave it on single shot. The ISO you've seen now, so you push those in like that, shows you the ISO. Metering, push that one down and you'll see that this one changes. Um, so you've got like that's going to be spot metering, that's sort of everything, and then that one's whatever it is. Because I honestly don't know. I normally just leave it in the the default position. I tend to leave all of the Canon cameras in the default position because it saves a lot of time just switching between cameras. And then I think if you press this one and this one, 
it's a multiple exposure, so you've got ME, one, two, three. You can dial in the amount of multiple exposures you want to do, up to nine. So it'll let you take up to nine pictures, or nine exposures on the one frame before it'll advance and wind on. You've also got exposure compensation down here, which I've got a feeling is one of these buttons. If I remember right. There we go. It's the right hand one of the two. The other one is the memory and focus lock, uh, an exposure and focus lock, if I remember right. So yeah, you can push that in, and that will give you overexposure going that way. And you want to give it a stop of underexposure, you push it back to that one. So you've got three stops in, I think those are in half stops, actually. If you want to do a bit of uh, under or overexposure. So say with a negative film, you want to give it a stop of overexposure. You just dial that up to one. If you read the, D, the the code from the DX, say Portra 400, it's set the ISO at 400, and this will give you a stop of overexposure on your film. I normally leave it in the middle. Right, so that one I've got a feeling is the focus and exposure lock. So you can you can focus on a certain area and take exposure readings in a certain area. I guess with a spot metering that would be really useful. Um, flash gun. Obviously Canon have tied you into their flash guns. Um, these use different flash guns than the digital cameras and don't use these old flash guns on digital cameras because it will probably fry them. Nice big eyepiece. Viewfinder is 100% like most professional cameras so it shows you exactly what's in the frame. On most consumer SLRs they only show you maybe 90, 92, 94% so don't be surprised if you get a little bit extra around the edges that you didn't see but with this it's 100% so it's exactly what you're going to see. The back, fairly simple, on off, got a beep, that could confirm when it's achieved autofocus I think. There you go, that just confirms autofocus. So you've got the rear command dial if you're going to be using that, uh, just put it into that one if you're not. Film rewind at the side, on the bottom there. And then behind here you have the hidden flap which has the, the sort of what they call custom functions, a bit like the, uh, the, T the T90, you open this little flap on the side, great if you've got nails, and then you can see here there's a button mark CF for custom function, you've got a battery check, you push that in, and it should give you the three bars on the top, like that, I'm going to get in what, two bars, oh, yeah, these batteries are not, they're on the way out, um, and you've also got the drive, so you can put, push those two together and you can change the uh, the drive, that's quite an awkward thing to do. But you've got single and continuous and with this booster pack on there you can get five and a half frames on it. I think there's a drive high and a drive low if I remember right. I can try pushing those buttons in and then changing the drive. I'm still doing exposure compensation. Oh, that's auto exposure bracketing if you push the two of them in. If you just push the drive one in, it goes single, continuous high, continuous low, and self timer. They're all driven off of that function. And you've got a choice of self timer times as well. So I'll just leave it on the single setting. And then you've got something underneath which is to clear. But out of these custom functions, and I can't remember what they do, I tend to just leave them at default. But the only one that I want to check on this camera is custom function 2. So again, you need your nails to push that in. And we should be able to change the custom functions, or read what the custom functions are. But I can't. Click on clear to reset it to the factory settings. So there's function 1 and function 2 and I think I want function 2 to be on the 1 setting if I remember right. Function that one there so maybe it's this back dial that changes those. I'll turn that on. No, it's not the back dial that changes them. I wonder how you set those. Uh, no, I 
does that. Let's just put it back in for that. Should have read up on this, but the uh, custom function two is the one about whether it leaves the leader out of the cassette or not. If you send your film to a processing lab, you can leave that on um, on zero, which is the normal default setting, and it will just rewind the film right back into the cassette. If, like me, you want to process at home, it's easier if you leave, leave the leader out. Um, so if you want to leave the leader out, then uh, it makes it a lot easier for loading the tanks. But you have to set this custom function to 1. And I haven't read the manual, so I haven't got a clue how you do that. There you go. You push the button again to set it to 1. And then that's it, uh, that's it done. And then, like you've seen, you just press the shutter and it comes back to the normal mode. So that now will leave the leader out for me, which is exactly what I want. Right, loading. Put the camera down on his nose. Tripod bush on the bottom, of course. Straps, the usual stuff. But yeah, quite a simple camera to use. Um, remote shutter release now is... Uh, this is a flash sync, actually. This is your PC sync socket on here. And this is where your cable release or in a valometer so it takes a picture every so often etc would connect into it. it's all electronic now in this generation it's not manual so I want to try this camera out it's probably could do with a set of batteries I don't know how long the batteries last in there how many films you get through but I'm putting today in a roll of Kentmere Pan 400 Ilford film an Ilford budget film You can see on here this has the uh, the DX markings on it, so when the camera reads those, it will uh, it will set the uh, so as you put your film cassette in, pull the leader across. This is called the leader. Make sure you don't touch the shutter curtain. So just pull this across to where the orange part is, like so. All you have to do is close the back, turn the camera on. You can see there it's. It's winding the film at the beginning, and you can see at the bottom there's like a strip which shows the film going through the camera. So we're in the program mode. Uh, this is a 36. If we check the ISO setting, it should be on 400, which it is. It's picked it up from the film canister. Don't have to worry about setting the film speed. Um, we're in the uh, <laughs> the program mode, some people call it the professional mode, which is a bit insulting. Most professionals would shoot this camera on manual, to be honest. I tend to use aperture priority because the aperture setting has the most impact on sort of the artistic side of your photograph, unless you're shooting sports or something where you want to be using a fast shutter speed. Um, shutter speed to me doesn't really matter with the sort of just general purpose photography I do, so I quite often shoot on program um, on the di digital cameras as well. So. I'm quite happy to use that, or aperture value, I just want to get really fancy. Very rarely use TV, uh, sometimes use manual, but not as often as you'd think. Film plane indicator on the back, lug straps, like I say, pretty heavy. Quality piece of kit for under £50. Um, when you think the Pentax K1000 with a lens is costing well over £100 now. And it doesn't do quite the same job as this one. I'm sort of think, well, it appealed to me because of the grip. That's the reason that I bought it. So zoom me back up out. There's another lens cap there. You can never have enough lens caps and filters. Yeah, I don't like this lens hood. It's ugly. Much prefer the old style lens hoods. But yeah, I think that just about covers it for today. Like I say, there's an on-off switch there for using this button here. I don't want to do now because it's got a film in it. Yeah, camera looks okay, it seems to be working. I've, I've dried run uh, film through it and it seems to be working just fine. Um, so one thing I did notice is it did wind the uh, test roll right back into the canister, which is why I looked up that custom function. There are other ones to do with some of the button functions, etc., but I just leave those all as default. Um, when you've got as many cameras as I have, I don't want cameras with different settings, I just want to be able to pick them up and use them. So, yeah. Now that I'm allowed out and the weather seems to be improving, I can get out and shoot some film. A nice change the first time. You can see there's a frame counter there, show number one. I think that's enough waffle for me for today. Thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed. Comments, questions, queries, etc. down below. Uh, 
a like and a subscription is an added bonus for me. It helps the channel grow a little bit. Well, it seems to be growing quite well on its own at the moment. And uh, I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Take care and bye.